Bars is back. Hit it. Ha. Sam and Oh God. What's up with you? Hip hop uncensored is the vibe, so subscribe. Hip hop uncensored is the vibe, so subscribe. Oh God, driving Sam and riding passenger side, and you heard it out the mouth of the greatest. I be out here working and grinding and doing things, but let's just keep it real. Let's keep it real. There are things that are there, which are put there, and which are implemented in such a way as to make things just a bit harder if you are a person of color, flat out. Flat out. Definitely, definitely. I appreciate all those words. So let's, let's move on to, to the Bill Cosby. You know, we were sitting around today and everybody got the word that the uh, Pennsylvania, uh, I think Supreme Court, it was overturned his conviction. Get into that. Get into why that happened and, and the details of that for the people who don't know and what that ultimately means now for Bill Cosby in this case. Well, so it turns out that the thing that nobody knows is, is that, and I, I read up on this as well today, I actually read the opinion today, which um, enlightened me quite a bit. Well, first of all, the underlying case was he, it was Benadryls that were given to this woman. I'm just going what? to say that. Yeah, it was Benadryls. I what? thought it was like some, like some serious drug. It was Benadryl. So Thank nobody you. knows that. It's that bad, like it was roofies. Yeah, no. No, that, it wasn't. It was Benadryl. So let's just start there. So there was a previous prosecutor who had. So the, the plaintiff or the, the victim in the case, she um, she had filed a complaint years after the alleged events. I think the alleged events occurred in 2005 and she she had a delayed report and the prosecutor at the time said had weighed the evidence, had taken a look at the statement, had looked at the evidence and and had come to the conclusion that he was not going to prosecute Bill Cosby. I'm going somewhere with this. Mm -hmm. So what what happened was, is that he decided that it would be in the victim's best interest if she pursued a civil action against Bill Cosby, mm -hmm. which she did. So in connection with that, Bill Cosby gave approximately four depositions. He gave those four depositions believing mm -hmm. that the prosecutor was not going to prosecute based upon what the prosecutor said. The prosecutor released the press release wherein he said he was declining to prosecute Bill Cosby because of this, this and this. And he laid out all the factors. He did not believe that the prosecution was going to be successful. So in reliance upon that, Bill Cosby's lawyers produced him for a deposition, multiple depositions during the course of which he made some incriminating statements and waived his right to be free from self-incrimination based upon the fact that he didn't think he was going to get prosecuted. Right. They then, the prosecutor who extended that offer and entered into that agreement, he then was no longer prosecutor. Two prosecutors later, somebody steps in and says, well, I think we're going to pursue this. And they did. And what they did was, is they used in connection with their um, their prosecution of Bill Cosby, the court allowed into evidence statements that he made during the course of those depositions, wherein he thought that he was he was free from or that he was immune to make those statements. Had he not believed that he was free to make those statements, his attorneys would have never produced him for a deposition. But they did, and he made statements. And then the, the subsequent prosecutor didn't honor the agreement. And then so what happened was is that the Court of Appeals in, in Pennsylvania, they said, well, you know, this was not, they didn't go by follow the structure and the rules of Pennsylvania statutes. And because it wasn't formal and because it didn't follow the statute, we don't feel like this is this was actually an agreement that can be um, uh, upheld. So they denied all Bill Cosby's motions, denied everything. He had motions to dismiss, motions to suppress the statement. All those motions were denied. All that stuff went into the fact finder. It turns with a verdict of guilty, right? So another thing that they did was they let in a bunch of evidence regarding a bunch of other people that, in my opinion, should not have been admitted into evidence. But the Supreme Court 
in ruling on this on on deciding that Bill Cosby should be released, what they did was is that they basically had two issues before them. They decided, okay, we're going to decide whether or not this agreement should have been upheld. One, and then the other issue was whether or not all this other stuff should have came into evidence. So they said, well, if we decide that this agreement should have been upheld, then we're not going to get into whether or not all this other stuff should have been admitted into evidence. Because if we decide that this agreement should have been upheld, then he should have never been prosecuted in the first place. So what they did was they went through a very tedious analysis of all the lower court opinion and all the evidence and, and came to the conclusion that the agreement should have been upheld because the prosecutor had the authority to enter into the agreement and that Bill Cosby relied upon it detrimentally. And as a result, he suffered a loss, which was a eventually a conviction. So the question of whether or not all that other stuff should have came in never even got decided today. In my opinion, it was a dog and pony show based upon all this other stuff that they tried, that they got into evidence trying to prove that a pattern or practice, but there are specific rules in the evidence which preclude a prosecutor from trying to bring in a whole bunch of prior bad acts. And in this case, all that stuff, I mean, just stuff that, in my opinion, should not have come in. Uh, yeah, there's, if I, I couldn't believe it when I read it myself. Now, can he, does he have any recourse to, uh, to sue for that? Yeah, I'm quite sure he will. I'm quite sure he will. And the former prosecutor, when he, he actually exchanged email communication. So this opinion uh, that the Supreme Court released yesterday, it has excerpts from those emails from the former prosecutor to the current prosecutor who prosecuted Bill Cosby saying that he believed that Bill Cosby would have recourse, civil recourse, if the state continued to pursue the prosecution. And I have a tendency to agree. Uh, it's, a, it's a breach of contract and and he suffered substantial damages. There's attorney fees. He was in he was in prison for approximately three years. Uh, I I think he goes after him, and I think he sues that the the, uh, the prosecutor potentially personally. So we'll see. Now you have a prosecutor and prosecutors prosecution that put in the evidence or uh, put things in evidence that didn't belong there, testimonies that didn't belong there. Why, in your opinion, did it take so long, three years and a bunch of denials and appeals and things like that for him to be released and for the Supreme Court to finally go, yeah, this was wrong. You got to release this man. All right. So it's the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. And the, the one thing that I will tell you about the law um, that I learned fairly early on is, is that you're dealing with some very, very, very smart folk who are able to reason around things and to give to analyze things and to phrase things in a manner which supports their opinion. These people are professionals at it. And that's what happened here. They were able to analyze things and to basically they cherry picked what they felt was going to support their conclusion. I'm, a, I'm really sad to say this, but because I don't know that Bill Cosby deserves the benefit of this doubt because he's not like you, he's not like me. The dude is rich as hell, but he still, no, no matter what, how you put it, he's still African American, and we're more likely to be prosecuted. It's just flat out what it is. I mean, let's just just keep it real. They pulled out all the stops to make sure that they prosecuted Bill Cosby and make sure that he stayed there. And I think that this court, this Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. They did the right thing. Now, how much did it cost for Bill Cosby to get this justice? I have millions and millions of dollars that neither you nor I would have access to. Right. Any yeah. other regular cat would still be in prison with no hope for getting right. out. That's yeah. what I think. Now, the original, the civil suit that he had to pay to the victims, um, does that affect it now? Would he be able to get that back or how does that work? That's a that's a good point because there was a clause. There usually is a, a clause in every settlement agreement, which is basically a hush clause that the person is uh, in agreement for in consideration for the amount that they receive that they're not going to disparage the 
other party or say anything else. So, yeah, I, I mean, personally, I would probably sue them too for violation and try to try to get back. It was like three point three eight million dollars. He may not do that because, you know, just for the fact of there's just still enough people out there that think that he's just guilty, that he just doesn't want to deal with that anymore with that particular victim. But I mean, as far as the state is concerned and the prosecutor, he may he may go after them. Now you have a situation where no circumstantial evidence was brought into this trial to put him DNA wise to a, these alleged crimes. You got a, alleged crimes that happened over three decades ago, and now he's obviously out of prison. But is the damage already done to his reputation? Because although he has a lot of it, a lot of support, a ton of support, in particular in our community, there's still a lot of people also in our community and beyond that think this man did it, that he's a monster, and he always will be a monster. So, um. Was damaged? Is, is it too little too late for his reputation? And if so, did whoever decide to put him in this situation win, in your opinion? Well, let me say this. I don't know if there's any winners or losers here. Everyone's invested here and everyone is lost. Yeah. I mean, I, I just can't imagine that there's any winners here. Um, but no, as far as his, his reputation, it's a, if I may say, it's a wrap. Yeah. It's a wrap for his for his name. Um, there's too many people. You know, I spoke to someone today indicating that I was going to speak on this particular issue. Someone that I trust, uh, someone whom I love, someone who's very close to me, who was just infuriated when they found out that he was released. This is an African-American woman. And mm -hmm she was convinced that he was guilty. Now, does she know that it, this was a Benadryl pill, a couple of, about three half pills of Benadryl? Nope. The person I spoke to takes Benadryl every day or every night to go to sleep. Yeah. She's gonna believe that he actually drugged this woman and had sex with her, and once she finds out that it was Benadryl, I don't know. Is she, once she finds out all the rest of this information, you know, she may change her opinion, but the point of the matter is, is that there's some people I don't give it. I don't care what you tell them. They're just going to believe what they're going to believe. I mean, if Trump's presidency hasn't proven anything, it's going to prove that. I mean, if you don't know that Trump was a liar, I mean, and he, he was detrimental to our society. And if after they raid the Capitol, you still support him, I don't know what to tell you. You know what I mean? Like, there's just some people who are just going to believe what they're going to believe. So when it comes to Bill Cosby, who is far less loved than Donald Trump in this country at this particular point, huh. he's not going he's not going to gain back a lot of favor at all. No. I want to get your opinion on um, something that Mark Lamont Hill said. Um, are you familiar with Mark Lamont Hill by any chance? I'm not <laughs> sure that I am. All right. Oh, he's a young brother um, who has a show um, called Black News now. He's like a political analyst. He said this. Um, he said, uh, Bill Cosby is not innocent. He has not been exonerated. His release means that Cosby, a sexual predator, was incarcerated within a criminal legal system that has little regard for his own rules and procedures as Cosby does for his victims. What's your opinion on that statement? Yeah, I, I don't know if the young brother has read the opinion and, and what actually occurred to Mr. Cosby and the fact that he was actually duped like so many young African-American males where he gave a statement that was then in turn used against him in a, a, against him in a court of law. I really don't know. And, and I just want to make this very clear. It's not necessarily about whether this was true. Mm -hmm. It's about justice. You see, I defend people that may be guilty every day. That might be the case. But what I expect is I expect for the United States and I expect for the Constitution to be upheld. I expect for equal justice. I expect for I expect justice. I expect uh, fairness. And that's not what he got here. He did not receive fairness. And that is the reason for that the conviction was overturned. But again, how many people are sitting in the Department of Corrections right now and given any state that are sitting there unfairly on some crap they probably didn't do? They <laughs> took pleas or they were convicted. There's people that get released every day uh, due to the Innocence Project who were convicted. 
So I'm not going to sit here and bellyache because, oh, Bill Cosby may have gotten out. For one person that gets out based upon the fact that we actually held the, the prosecutor to a standard, one person with a bunch of money gets out. You want to start belly aching about that one person. What about the hundreds and thousands of people that are in prison, who died in prison, who were killed in prison, who did not have the prosecutor held to their word, held to fairness? That's what I want to look at. Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, it's a lot of people out here that just want their opinions validated. Like, like for example, with Mark, Mark Lamont Hill, shout out to the brother, but him just going out there and blatantly saying he's guilty without really knowing, like, well, also this can, this, this, uh, uh, situation get thrown out doesn't mean that he's not or oh, he's innocent or guilty it just means it was thrown out there's no circumstantial evidence to keep that man in there how how in your opinion public opinion how does that affect and how does that um uh, uh get into the trial's head people's head when they start hearing public opinion about certain people does that have an influence on the trial in your opinion yeah i mean honestly so that's kind of you know, i think i what i understand is is your question to be is how dissemination of certain information affects public opinion. Is that basically what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Like, okay, he has a trial going on, it's ongoing. Uh, now he's released, but you still have people screaming guilty, guilty, guilty. And now we have the public perception. Um, like even during a trial, does that perception from the outside influence what's going on on the inside? Yeah, I mean, people are, are told to not pay attention, but yeah, I mean, people <laughs> are told to not watch the news and you know, the, the, the legal system puts on blinders and we all assume and we expect for the jury to follow the instructions. And a lot of times they do. It's not my place here today or ever to question the whole system with regard to our belief that jurors are not going to pay attention. But I mean, as a lay person, as a person, do I believe that every person is going to listen to what, what the judge says? I don't know. I, I just I don't know that that's possible in our world today. Um, it's it's really difficult, and it it just is what it is. Now, as an officer of the court, I can't I can't sit here and say that I believe that jurors are not going to follow a judge's commands. But I mean, as as a person, you you make the decision yourself. Do you think that everybody who is told not to watch the news or listen or engage in any conversation about a particular topic? that they're going to do it, that they're going to be able to stop somebody else, so that they're going to stop somebody in mid and say, wait, 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 hold on, you know you can't talk to me about that. I wish you could, man, but not. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that that's going to happen. Now, as far as moving forward after the trial with Bill Cosby, again, like I said, it's, it's, it's a wrap for him, but that man happens to be so old that he would just like to just be able to go home and, and, and die peacefully, uh, right. you know, in his home with his wife and being able to see people he's probably just happy to be out he's not he doesn't have any plans to work any further but if the man was still trying to work he would probably he'd probably never find a job nobody's going to employ him whatsoever i mean can you imagine this all right so there's a couple of things that really can screw you up <laughs> in your criminal history the fact that you were actually convicted of rape sexual assault can you imagine being 30 years old and having that and people and going to get an interview i mean you're yeah. you're not going to get that job bro i mean you can say what you want to say well you're not supposed to consider that because i was acquitted right good yeah. luck yeah good, yeah good luck with that so uh yeah if he were still out there there's just i just just no way he'd be working he's not gonna get any roles nobody's gonna watch there'd be picketing there'd be everything else and so let me get to that what i was saying before though in the law I mean, there's certain things that people are just going to stay away from. Like, employers are not going to potentially hire you if you've been convicted of theft, whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And batteries, things of that nature, because you become a liability. I mean, what empl employers don't want to hire somebody who may steal from them, right. right? Or someone who may batter somebody else. So what if you were, as an employer, you go and hire somebody that you know good and daggone well was convicted of battery. That person then loses their temper in an accident and gets in a fight with somebody. So now that person comes back and sues the employer and says, well, hey, you knew or should have known that this person had a propensity for violence and you still hired him. 
Thus, you place me in danger and you are responsible for the damages as much as that person is. So they just avoid it all together. It's going to be the same with him if he were working. Now, um, I heard that the, one of the prosecutors, they said uh, something like, I hope this doesn't like discourage more victims from coming out. Do you see in the future that they could try to, you know, bring more, you know, uh, charges or cases up against him? How do you feel about that? I, I don't believe they probably will. I think that the prosecutor who initially extended the offer uh, for immunity was what his intent was, was to extend immunity with regard to that specific victim. He was not trying to preclude them from prosecuting him in connection with other victims or in connection or prevent other jurisdictions from filing actions against him. He has been released in connection with that matter and that matter alone. So how they'll, you know, I think they may try to figure out some way to get around statute of limitations in some other cases. Um, I'm still not quite sure how they totally got around it in this case. I wasn't able to get that far into the opinion to figure that part out, but okay. uh, I still am not sure how they got around that because the woman was an adult when it happened. Sometimes the statute of limitations is told, meaning that let's say if you're 14 years old and you get raped by someone who is 18 or 19 years old. So you're still a child. So from the time from 14 to 18, the statute doesn't begin until you're an adult. So now if you come forward at 19, you still have, you're still within the statute of limitations. Those four years didn't count against you for a child, but how this, how they got around, I'll have to go back and do some more deeper research to figure out how they got around statute of limitations in this case, in the first place, it might've been 15 years or something. They may have been within it. I'm not real sure. I had to take a look at Pennsylvania law on that. In your expert opinion, what are the next steps? Is uh, Mr. Cosby home safe, feeling comfortable, or is there some other hurdles he's going to have to cross over? I, I don't think the man will ever be comfortable. I think the man is going to be a pariah for the remainder of his life. But, mm -hmm. I mean, he's a rich pariah, a very rich pariah. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming he still has some of that money left. But So that there won't be – I mean, but we're not talking about a guy who has to go to Walmart to get his groceries. Right. You know, or something like that, or to go shopping. He doesn't have to do that. Um, he can sit back and live the remainder of his lives on life on a on a on an island somewhere. My assumption is is that Bill Cosby is going to try to disappear. He may come back and sue um, the state and so forth, but for the most part, I think he just he disappears. That's what I think is going to happen. Unless they try to bring additional charges, which they may. But from his perspective, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming that he would just as well just be done with the entire thing, the entire ordeal. And just because I'm sure he feels like he was very beloved. And just like OJ, a person who has been very beloved to all of a, all of a sudden becomes hated mm -hmm. by so many people. They just it's just like they don't know how to handle it and they just disappear. So. My, my, my last question will be, um, we appreciate you, you know, uh, yes, sticking sir. with us for 35 minutes. Yeah. Um, what does this mean for the Me Too movement, in your opinion? Um, the, does it, you know, kind of stop people from coming? What do you think about that now? Yeah, I think you kind of touched upon that in another question. Sometimes I get a little carried away, so please forgive me. Okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, there, there, there's probably going to be a faction of people that are going to say, well, well, look what happened to Bill Cosby. He got released on a technicality. That wasn't a daggone technicality. That was the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a technicality, my guy. Right. Uh, but that's what they're calling it. Even these seasoned lawyers, oh, it was a technicality. It's not a freaking technicality. My dude <laughs> got... You know, he, he testified and, and, and he should have been granted immunity. So how do, what happens with the Me Too movement? Um, I think they still feel empowered. Um, I think that it's still very dangerous uh, for people in power to think that they can get away with anything at this particular time. And so I don't think that there will be an issue. Um, I think that, that, that movement is going to continue forward and it's going to continue strong. So hold on, I apologize. I've got some, some stragglers in the background when I advise them. Oh, yeah, that's what happens when you go to do things from the home office. Oh, we understand, brother. 
Yeah. Um, okay. My, my final question, we definitely appreciate you, appreciate you, like my cousin said, to kind of extend on that. Do you think that now with Bill Cosby's release that some of the men currently sitting behind bars due to the Me Too movement will now have a newfound um, inspiration or optimism in thinking that their cases can be overturned, even though case by case basis, they're very different? Um, I don't know if there's going to be any empowerment from this one. This one is so, to me, was so egregious when I actually saw what happened. I mean, the prosecutor specifically promised that they wouldn't be, they wouldn't use the statements in a criminal prosecution. And then they came back and used the statements in a criminal prosecution. That's, that is so egregious that it's unbelievable. So I don't know that this empowers other people, but it may say somebody who's there, you know, as you may know, anybody who's in jail or who's in prison, they're always looking. The only thing that they can concentrate on sometimes is how do I get out of here? How do I get out of here? So when it comes to that, I, I, I would have to agree with the fact that there are probably will be some people that will look to Bill Cosby and say, well, look, his lawyer's got him all. Why can't you do the same for me? Mm -hmm. probably going to happen because it happens every day in every prison in the United States of America. So, yeah, there, there probably be, will be some empowerment there. De definitely appreciate Attorney B.D. Williams here on the Hip Hop Uncensored podcast. Leave your contact information, your, your website, social media, whatever you want the people to be able to, uh, to find you, you know, for your services or for interviews. And, or and I'd like to add, I am the people's lawyer created okay. by the people, by God, anointed by God to serve the people. Um, so I handle domestic cases and things of that nature because sometimes lawyers, they just don't understand. They don't talk to people like people need to be talked to. People don't speak legalese. They speak the way we are speaking right now. And that's the way people should be advised. You should be able to go from the courtroom to the locker room. And back and forth. Um, and that's what I do. So, um, you know, about you, I'm going to go back to, you know, how you became a lawyer. He was letting me know that you got stopped at some point and that kind of motivated you to become, you know, um, an attorney. Could you, could you tell us that story and tell us your motivation behind becoming an attorney, please? Yeah, that was multifaceted. Uh, I was a college football player at Ball State University in Indiana. I was a division one player. Um, I ended up uh, not getting drafted. I was still around school. I was in graduate school. I was studying to be a forensic profiler. Um, I was doing fairly well, went out one evening. Uh, a couple of my teammates got into an altercation with some guys that were looking for a fight, just to say generally. I bumped into one of the police officers, you know, uh, outside the scene. It was uh, outside the scene of a bar and, you know, I was arrogant, young, you know, and said, you know, you'll be working in Alaska by, you know, quoting Scarface. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't take that too well. Um, so they ended up following me from the bar and they pulled me over on the side of the road and um, asked me out of the vehicle and, you know, had me place my hands against the car. I thought they were just about to search me, but what they did was they tried to handcuff me. I wasn't trying to hear that. Um, kept my hands there on the, on the vehicle which they didn't like. And so they started to club uh, multiple officers, clubbing, kicking, pepper spray, and the entire nine. Um, I only yielded when they threatened to uh, arrest my girlfriend at the time, who was already, I already knew, going to be a lawyer and going to law school. And um, they were threatening her future. So I, I yielded. But at that time, I had never been in any trouble. I was a I was a graduate student. I was pre-med. I was then I went to psychology. Uh, I was academic, everything throughout the entirety of my life. I'd never been in any trouble. So mm -hmm. they took something from me and that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to take that from me. They wanted to take that power away from me to show me that I wasn't what I thought I was, that mm -hmm. in reality, I'm just another, you mm -hmm. know, without me saying that we know where that goes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I, I decided, you know, I packed up, I left graduate school after completing the semester and started my, my uh, pursuit of law school, my law, my law degree. So right now you, you are number rank number one class rank. Also, that is correct. Okay. That is correct. two and a half years, graduating two and a half years. Number one. 
Awesome. Where, where did this happen at? What state did this happen in? This is uh, Indiana. Indiana. So we're in good old Muncie, Indiana. Mm. And how, how is usually law enforcement taken out there when it comes to people in our community? I mean, I tell you what, when I left Indiana to go to school in Illinois, and I went to law school in Chicago, I thought I would never come back to Indiana. I can tell you that much. Wow. Uh, there's certain parts of Indiana to this very day that yeah. even I, as a lawyer, don't necessarily want to go to. Mm -hmm. I am just now at the age of 46 getting to the point where I feel confident to go into certain portions and certain areas and feel like I can walk out and be fine. But yeah, I mean, it's still, there's still parts of Indiana that are back. You know, this at one point was home of the Klan at one point. Indiana was. So uh, it is what it is. And to act like as though, well, that was 40 years ago when my mother was born in 1958. Yeah. She didn't get into a desegregated school until, until 1968. She had me when she was 16. So she had only been in a desegregated environment for six years before I was born. So and she was young. So that's to say that the people that were exposed and that were brought up during this stuff, they're still out there and they still had children and they raised children. And those ideas are passed down now somewhere along the line. Sometimes those things don't are not manifested, but we would be foolish to believe that thoughts and ideologies that were there just a few years ago, which were shared by parents, are not going to be exhibited by their children. It'd be foolish. Yeah, so, Pop. Now, now, being um, you know, a criminal defense attorney, um, now when you get pulled over, um, do they give you any leeway, police, or is kind of like the same thing? I mean, obviously, you know more now. You're an attorney. Do you let them know that now when you get pulled over? Like, how's that engagement now? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I do, and I tell all my clients, I don't, I don't put myself in a position. I do my best to avoid. Right being put in a position where I'm going to give them any authority over my being or over my person whatsoever. Uh, that's the first part. Uh, the second part is I'm very smart. I, I'm not going to tell them I'm a lawyer. Okay. There's no point in doing that. I'm just going to be quiet and let it go down and see what happens. And then I know that my the way I fight a battle will not be on the side of the road. We'll fight it in court. And I'm not going to tell you we'll fight it in court. Right. We'll just see you in court. There's no point in me saying it because all I'm doing with that is elevating the circumstance. What's more, as a lawyer, if I sit there and say, oh, I'm a lawyer, I'm a lawyer, I'm a lawyer. Now this gets in front of a committee and they're looking at me like, well, I was behaving an ass and I put the whole legal profession, you know, in a bad light, which could then subject me to discipline. Yeah. So I'm not going to do that at all. What we're going to do is we're going to take it to an environment where I am a lawyer, which is court, and we could meet it out there where you're going to call me sir and not just be patronizing me on the side of the road calling me sir. You're really going to mean it in court. So Absolutely. powerful. Absolutely. Now, we, we sat in a federal trial a couple of years back, ARS trial um, in Philadelphia, and what we watched was a defense completely annihilate and destroy any prosecution story or anything they had whatsoever. We walked in there and we looked and just from our eyes and listening to what we were hearing and seeing what we were seeing, it looked clear that ARF was going to be exonerated from all those crimes given the the powerful um the powerful defense that he had and the and all the evidence that they had. It just seemed like it was a foregone conclusion. But we know the rates of the FBI and how they get there happened to him 45 years how many times are you go into a courtroom and you know all the evidence and everything is on your side but at the end of the day you know that judge or the the, the prosecution or whatever the case may be it may be a fixed game to begin with well i think the problem lies in this there's a reasonable doubt standard so the problem is is that with you or i what is a versus uh, somebody of a different persuasion somebody named you know whatever it may be uh mm -hmm or whatever, uh, Jim, whatever, whatever, uh, Caucasian. Mm -hmm. The doubt that he did it versus the doubt that you or I did it is going to be a lot higher than it's going to be for us. The problem is, is that reasonable depends upon who you're talking to. 
they're going to find it a lot more likely that I beat my son or my child or did this or did that than they are somebody that looks like them. And it really is something that is implicit bias. It's there. They, you know, if you haven't been, I've practiced with people who became prosecutors and their only interaction with people of color was right there as a prosecutor. Wow. You don't have no cousins, no, no brothers. You got no peoples that, you know, smoked, you know, there's good people who smoke weed every day, yeah. but get their business. They take care of their business, you know, uh, but they, if you don't have any interaction with folks and don't have any any clue of what it is to be like and what they think like or what it is to be them, mm-hmm. then it, your your standard of reasonable doubt is is completely different and jaded. So, to get back to your initial question, I mean, I've gotten to a, a lot of situations. I warn my clients of color that this is what it is. This is what the jury is. This is what. It's my job to try to make the jury understand that this person sitting here that is my client, that this person is a person, yeah. and that, that we all came from a common denominator. You see, when we first, when this country first started, it, there was a plan because at that point, the king of England was treating the colonists like they were less than people, less than men. That was the whole point of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. There is a common denominator right there. You know, so what I try to do is I try to make sure that I hold them responsible and hold them to the standard that was established in the first place. You know, I I get into the Salem witch trials about how people were killed based upon just somebody saying something. Well, I, I, I believe she was a witch, you know, um, that, that's basically what happened. There was no due process and just somebody, some accusation. But the problem is, is that there's still a lot of that going on. Just based upon a single statement here in the state of Indiana, you could be arrested and held on a bond that you cannot afford. $100,000, $200,000. Who's got that? Just sitting away. Who's got $10,000 in the bank to make a bond? So you sit, you're sitting there in jail without the possibility, your mom, your mom's ain't got no money. Your baby mama ain't got no money. Nobody that you know, everybody's trying to get money together so that you can get out. So what happens? You're more likely to take a plea. So then you take a plea potentially to a felony. So now you cannot bear arms anymore. So don't, but so, which means that if you are in those environments, which require you to potentially have a firearm to defend yourself, you're going to be looking at substantial time yeah. Just for exercising your constitutional right, which you ended up waiving because you were in a position that you couldn't even get out of jail on something that you didn't even do based upon an allegation on a bond. And a bond was set based upon a, on an allegation that you you hadn't even had a chance to defend yet. So it, it, it's it's uh, there's a there's a lot going on there. There's a lot which tends uh, intends or. Uh, often permeates or continues to instigate the situation whereby young African Americans continue to be held behind. And I'm not one of these people, you know, I worked hard to get to where I am. I'm not saying that, hey, you know, that people should not be out here working and and grinding and, and doing things, but let's just keep it real. Let's keep it real. There are things that are there which are put there and which are implemented in such a way as to make things just a bit harder if you are a person of color, flat out. 